All right. Um, good morning, everybody. My name is uh, Maritere Padilla Rodriguez, and I'm the Director of Policy and Advocacy of Hispanic Federation in Puerto Rico. Hispanic Federation is really proud to host this webinar and present our campaign to overrule the insular cases in collaboration with Latino Justice, Equally American, and the ACLU. Also, we thank each of you for joining today to discuss this important issue. First, we want to clarify that if you need Spanish, tra Spanish translation, we have simultaneous uh, interpretation by just clicking the globe symbol at the bottom of your screen. Para todas las personas que necesiten traducción al español, pueden acceder a eh, pueden acceder el, el icono, el globo de español uh, abajo en su pantalla. Also, if you have questions, please, you can send them through the Q&A tool at the bottom of your screen. And if you have comments, please send them through the chat. Since 2017, Hispanic Federation has been working on the ground in Puerto Rico to support the recovery after Hurricane Maria. And through that time, we have definitely identified the systemic federal discrimination established by the insular cases as one of the main barriers for the protection of basic needs, human rights, and dignity of the people that live in Puerto Rico. We believe that regardless of the territorial relationship with the federal government, the federal government must respect our basic dignity and overrule the insular cases. That is why today we are going to discuss the following. First, the recent Supreme Court decision in the case Vallejo Madero and the federal discrimination in public benefits. We're gonna learn of why this issue is important to everybody. Second, the basics of the United States empire and its colonies problem. Third, we are going to have a deeper legal discussion about the Vallejo Madero decision. Also, we are going to talk about what are the insular cases and why they should be overruled. Next slide. Um, also, we're gonna address important issues and address how you can help us in this campaign. Finally, we're gonna have a space for question and answer discussion with all of you. Um, for all this, next slide, please. For all this, we have four fabulous presenters that I want to introduce. First, we have Laura Esquivel, Vice President of Federal Policy and Advocacy of Hispanic Federation. Second, Leah Fiol Mata, Senior Counsel of Latino Justice. Alejandro Ortiz, Senior Staff Attorney of ACLU Racial Justice Program. And Neil Weir, President and Founder of Equally America. So with no further ado, I introduce our first presenter, Laura Esquivel from Hispanic Federation. Thank you. Uh, buenos dias, everybody. I think I unmuted myself now. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we are uh, very happy to have you. Can I get the next slide? So many of you heard um, about a, the Supreme Court decision a few weeks ago, um, United, States, United States versus Valle Madero. Um, in keeping this, this was a case that was had to do with um, federal benefits, um, whether or not federal benefits would be provided to a US citizen who moved from New York to Puerto Rico and lost his benefits when he did that, his SSI benefits as a disabled man. Um, and in keeping with its long tradition, we know what the court decided last week. Uh, we expected to lose the case. Um, in fact, the only hope was that President Biden would um, keep his campaign promises and not continue the Trump administration's appeals of the lower cases. The lower cases, two federal courts said that it was discriminatory and unconstitutional to deny Mr. Valle Madero his social security uh, disability benefits simply because of where he lived. Um, in spite of calls by over 560, uh, by over uh, 60 organizations to withdraw the appeal, um, the uh, 
uh, both before and after it was, um, uh, before and after the Supreme Court agreed to hear it, um, the Biden administration went to court and argued why it was legal to not treat Puerto Ricans equally when it came to federal safety net programs intended to help the most vulnerable US citizens. Now, I should add, this was not unique to the Biden administration. Every administration it, for the past hundred years has held that same position that um, because of uh, uh, cases uh, called, a group of cases called the insular cases, which is what we're here to talk about today, um, as well as um, something that was added in the constitution that was included in the constitution, um, the courts have continued, the Supreme Court has continued to um, rule with the government and say that they have every right to discriminate against people who live in Puerto Rico. But in a shocking, even to us, eight to one decision, um, the Supreme Court um, agreed with the government. Uh, and it was, uh, it was really dismaying, um, really dismaying. We did not expect to lose that badly because in fact, there have been many Supreme Court uh, cases and decisions uh, and justices who have agreed with us that these cases were decided incorrectly. Um, so I'm going to give you a, a brief overview of a video here that can really kind of set the landscape and provide the context for what we're going to talk about today. Um, David, do you want to play? have called this treatment unconstitutional. However, 
There is no disputing that this unequal treatment is one of the main causes of Puerto Rico's current crisis. Soon as we returned to Puerto Rico, we lost many of the benefits we were eligible for while living in Florida. Isabella lost her SSI. Uh, thank you so much, um, David. I'm unable to start my video. So, okay, here we go. Now I can do that. There we go. Thanks. Um, so that was just a, a quick overview. That video was made before the case was decided at the Supreme Court. The court did face that crossroads. And as I said, it uh, continued in the long tradition of siding with the government and legislating, uh, I'm sorry, and, uh, and, and putting into law um, that it was perfectly fine to continue this discrimination. Um, next slide. So why does this matter? Um, you know, there are, have been a lot of um, excuses or explanations about why the federal government should be allowed to do this, including that residents of Puerto Rico don't pay federal taxes, et cetera. And a lot of that is misinformation. Residents of Puerto Rico pay full federal payroll taxes to finance Social Security and Medicare, just as stateside residents do. And Puerto Ricans also pay federal import and export taxes. And when required by law, they file federal income tax returns. These are all, you know, these are smoke screens and really not, um, not do not provide a, a, an explanation um, that really holds water or makes sense. Um, in 1901, less than two years after Puerto Rico and Guam were at were ceded to the U.S. after four months of bombing of San Juan by the uh, American military, um, many people, including President Teddy Roosevelt, considered the inhabitants of the new American possessions inferior beings. Um, and he said then that besides acting in good faith, we have acted with good sense. Uh, we have not been frightened or misled into giving being the people of Puerto Rico a form of government unsuitable to them, while providing that the people should govern themselves as far as possible, we have not hesitated in their own interest to keep the power of shaping their destiny. And it was soon after that, within two years of the U.S. Uh, taking possession of Puerto Rico, there was a series of cases decided um, from 1901 to 1905, which became known as the first of the insular cases that the Supreme Court constitutionally justified imperialist pol policies toward the territories of Hawaii, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines. And President Roosevelt clearly favored the court's imperialist groundwork. Um, the initial series of insular cases were decided by a very slim by four uh, divided court. So when a vacancy on the court occurred, making it possible for Roosevelt to uh, appoint a replacement, it became paramount for him and in fact a litmus test for his next appointee that they would uphold the court's president, precedent. Um, and he uh, initiated, uh, uh, obtained in writing, in writing from his nominee, Oliver Wendell Holmes, that his appointment was conditioned on his commitment to upholding the policy um, on the insular cases. And that is what exactly what he did. And over the years, various Supreme Court justices and other judges have, uh, have joined, uh, voiced concerns about the continued validity of the insular cases doctrine, most recently, Justice Gorsuch. Um, so we, um, next slide. Um, we are going to talk a little bit today about how this came about, provide some context, because it's really um, important, as we know with anything uh, contemporary, that you cannot really understand it without understanding the historical context and how we got here. So I'm going to turn this over now to, uh, to Neil from Equally American to give us some of that background. Thanks, Laura, and I really appreciate the Hispanic Federation hosting this important conversation today. So I'm just going to run through um, some basic history about U.S. territories and the United States colonies problem. Um, there are five populated U.S. territories, 
the furthest east points of the United States, Puerto Rico and the US Virgin Islands um, in the Caribbean, uh, the furthest west points in the United States, Guam and the Northern Mariana Islands, and then the furthest south part of the United States, American Samoa, with a number of other uninhabited islands uh, that you can also see on the map. Next slide, please. And uh, you know, there's nothing perhaps more striking of the evidence of the failure of federal policy and discrimination towards residents of these areas than uh, looking at the population of these areas themselves. So as you, you see here, um, between 2010 and 2020, um, there's a dramatic population decrease in US territories as residents of these areas um, have had to move elsewhere to find uh, healthcare, economic opportunities um, as a result of some of the federal discrimination that we're talking about today. In Puerto Rico, a population decrease of almost 12%, some of that related to the, the failure to respond properly to Hurricanes Marie and Irma. Um, one other thing to note here is the population of these areas, uh, overwhelmingly people of color. Um, and that's something that has played into uh, these issues as Laura suggested from the very beginning with the insular cases and a thread that continues unfortunately on to today. Uh, next slide, please. Um, just a brief history, uh, uh, as Laura said, Puerto Rico and Guam were spoils of the Spanish-American War. Um, American Samoa became part of the United States in 1900 and 1904 through deeds of session signed by their leaders. Uh, the US Virgin Islands was actually purchased uh, in 1917, um, including the people who lived there. Uh, the Northern Mariana Islands became part of the United States uh, through a covenant agreement in 1976 that became effective in 1986. So you have this kind of brief period of, of real imperial expansion um, in the early 1900s, and yet today we're still living with the consequences and the United States has not fully grappled with its own colonial history. Next slide, please. And, and what has that meant in the territories today? You have uh, 3.6 million residents who can't vote for president, don't have voting representation in Congress. At the same time, as, as Laura had said, um, they pay uh, lots of federal taxes, uh, almost $4 billion a year. Um, they don't have meaningful autonomy or sovereignty. Uh, Self-determination has not been fully supported and recognized, although there are efforts in Congress uh, in the new Puerto Rico Status Act to, to try to address some of those issues. Um, denied participation in programs from Medicaid, SSI to SNAP. Uh, and of course, Puerto Rico is, is governed by this undemocratic oversight board, the PROMESA board. Um, all of this uh, completely contrary to America's uh, founding principles, democratic values, uh, and constitution, and yet now almost 125 years into these relationships, um, the United States has still yet to even recognize that it has a colonies problem, much less find a solution for it. Uh, next slide, please. I'll go ahead and hand this off uh, to the next presenter. Thank you, good morning, buenos dias a todos. So on the morning of oral arguments on November 9th of 2021, and these were the oral arguments in the Vallejo Madero matter in Washington, DC, representatives from various civil rights and public benefits organizations, in addition to Aurelis, which you saw in the video previously, a mother whose young disabled daughter lost her SSI benefits after she re relocated from Florida to Puerto Rico. Now she had moved to Florida after Hurricane Maria because of the effects of Hurricane Maria. And then when she wanted to return home to Puerto Rico, her disabled daughter lost her SSI benefits. So she was one of the participants at the press conference as well. And we were on the steps of the Supreme Court in support of extending SSI benefits to Puerto Rico and overruling the insular cases. Next slide. <clears throat> 
So the decision in Valle Madero presents both challenges and opportunities. Um, as Laura said earlier, we were terribly disappointed that this only had one dissenting opinion, and I'll get into that in a few minutes. So by an eight to one majority, the Supreme Court, as Laura mentioned, reversed two lower court decisions. Um, that was the First Circuit Court of Appeals and also the District Court for the District of Puerto Rico, which agreed based on equal protection that excluding otherwise eligible individuals from SSI is irrational and arbitrary and goes against the essence itself of the Constitution. The court rejected the view that Congress must extend SSI to residents of Puerto Rico to the same extent as residents of the states because the territory clause gives Congress the right to make that determination. And the government's argument that Puerto Rico pays insufficient taxes or insufficient federal taxes provides a rational basis for denying the benefit to otherwise qualified, poor, disabled, and elderly individuals. Um, the opportunities that it presents, and we'll talk more about this later on in this presentation um, regarding a challenge to the insular cases that is um, before the Supreme Court, is that Justice Gorsuch in his concurrence and Justice Sotomayor in her dissent expressed hope that the Supreme Court will stop relying on the misguided framework of the insular cases when interpreting the Constitution and deciding what rights apply to the territories. You can move to the next slide, please. So it's really important to understand that the territory clause of the Constitution is rooted in imperialism and in racism. With the exception of the 13 colonies, the other states of the Union were first territories, and their people were afforded all of the protections of the Constitution, as they were primarily, the residents were primarily white. At the turn of the 20th century though, the constitution did not fully follow the flag to newly acquired overseas territories as their inhabitants described in court decisions as alien races and savage tribes were mostly non-white. The court relied on the territory clause of the constitution which states that Congress may make all needful rules and regulations respecting the territory belonging to the United States and has broad authority to legislate with respect to the US territories. And I wanna emphasize the word belonging. I mean, we all know this, but let's just say it again. Territories are possessions. They belong to the United States and Congress has the authority to make decisions about all five of the territories. Congress may distinguish the territories from the states and tax and benefit programs such as SSI, so long as Congress has a rational basis for doing so. This is from the decision, right? What the court fails to acknowledge is that residents of Puerto Rico are almost exclusively, obviously Puerto Rican, in other words, Latinas and Latinos, and those of the other territories are predominantly people of color. So almost all of the residents of the territories almost all of them are people of color. So black, brown, people with Asian and Pacific Islander heritage. And that would trigger strict scrutiny analysis, which is the highest standard of review under an equal protection challenge. Yet instead the court used rational basis, which is the lowest and the easiest standard to satisfy to justify the denial of SSI benefits to Puerto Rico. The court ruled that because Puerto Rico does not pay federal income tax, although federal employees in Puerto Rico do pay federal taxes and Puerto Rico pays payroll taxes in addition to other taxes that Laura mentioned, that fact alone for the court provides a rational basis under the territory clause for the denial of SSI benefits to qualified residents of Puerto Rico. Next slide. Again, we are all very disappointed that other liberal justices did not join the dissent and we only had one dissenting opinion and that was Sonia Sotomayor and her dissent is precious. It's really worth reading very carefully. So Justice Sotomayor was the only justice to point out that the territory clause does not give license to Congress to treat US citizens unfairly based on where they live. 
She stated that there is no rational basis. Remember, that's the test that the court used. She stated there is no rational basis for Congress to treat needy citizens living anywhere in the United States so differently from others, particularly in a uniform federalized direct to individual poverty reduction program like SSI. So I wanna point out that Justice Sotomayor emphasizes that SSI is not a benefit for all of the residents of Puerto Rico. It's not a program for Puerto Rico as a territory. This is a program for individuals who otherwise meet all of the requirements to receive this benefit. In other words, those who are poor, elderly, and or disabled. She says it is irrational to tie an individual's entitlement to SSI to that individual's place of residency. And SSI is a means tested program of last resort for the poorest Americans who lack the means to even pay taxes. Residents of Puerto Rico who would be eligible for SSI are just like SSI recipients in every other material respect. They are needy US citizens living in the United States. Next slide, please. Justice Sotomayor states that while it is true that residents of Puerto Rico typically are exempt from paying some federal taxes, that distinction does not create a rational basis to distinguish between them and other SSI recipients. By definition, SSI recipients pay few, if any, taxes at all. And in her words, it is antithetical to the entire premise of the program to hold that Congress can exclude citizens who can scarcely afford to pay any taxes at all on the basis that they do not pay enough taxes. The territory clause does not permit Congress to ignore the equally weighty constitutional command that it treat the United States citizens equally. And Justice Sotomayor, she makes us so proud. She is the one to point out that this decision is especially cruel. And she uses that word very appropriately because Puerto Rico has a disproportionately large number of seniors and people with disabilities because almost half of the residents of Puerto Rico live below the poverty line and they, Puerto Rico residents do not have a voting representative in Congress. That means that Puerto Rico cannot turn to the political process for help. They are a powerly disenfranchised population. And so she and her dissent, and I again invite everyone to read it very carefully. She presents many other statistics that demonstrate that Puerto Rico is perhaps, and I say this without you know, uh, the site right in front of me, perhaps the poorest of all of the territories of the United States. It definitely would be, if it were to become a state, it would be the poorest state of the nation by far, if that were to happen. So the need in Puerto Rico is so great. And so Justice Sotomayor um, makes us proud by being brave and stating that reality very clearly in her dissent. So thank you. And we can continue to the next slide and the next presenter. Thank you, Leah. Good morning, everyone. Um, as others mentioned, the Valle Madero decision had a robust discussion of the insular cases. The insular cases are a line of Supreme Court cases decided at the turn of the 20th century addressing whether and to what extent the constitution applied in the newly acquired island territories whose inhabitants are here in this slide represented by the black and brown children in the front row of the schoolhouse, uh, Cuba, Hawaii, Puerto Rico, Philippines who are being scolded by a condescending Uncle Sam. Next slide, please. What are the insular cases? Uh, the, the same court that endorsed racial segregation in Plessy v. Ferguson also decided the insular cases. What do the insular cases do? Uh, they invented a distinction between so-called incorporated territories and unincorporated territories. Incorporated territories were those Congress had indicated were on the path for statehood. Uh, they were incorporated and thus the constitution would apply fully there. In unincorporated territories, by contrast, the constitution applied only in part, leaving it to Congress to decide to what extent the constitution would apply. This distinction, this incorporation theory 
has no home in the Constitution, not its text, not its purpose, nor its history until then. Uh, the so-called incorporation theory was made up by the court. Uh, and why was this distinction made up? Why did the court conjure up this incorporation theory? Because of the people who, who inhabited the, the new overseas colonies. The justices explicitly feared the consequences of fully extending the constitution to the so-called alien races and savages living in the overseas territories. Because those people were people of color, that was a real problem for the court. Let's not embrace these savages into the US polity. That was the court's thinking. Uh, the Minnesota cases are also infamous for enshrining colonialism into the constitution. Their doctrine that the constitution could be indefinitely withheld from people in overseas territories until Congress says otherwise was designed to make it easier for the US to conquer new territories. As the court put it, the US will not be able to use its so-called right to acquire new lands if the result would be to endow constitutional protections on people absolutely unfit in the court's eyes to receive them. Next slide, please. Though they, they may have had a spat in January of this year declining uh, regarding uh, Justice Gorsuch's uh, decision to decline to wear a mask during an oral argument, Justice Gorsuch and Justice Sotomayor came together in Valle Madero to support overruling the insular cases. This union between these two illustrates that whether the insular cases should remain on the books is not a partisan issue. Gorsuch was appointed by Republican, Sotomayor by a Democrat, and both agree that the time is now to overrule the insular cases. Insular cases. Next slide, please. Uh, this is another picture illustrating how the insular cases treated the so-called unincorporated territories here, Puerto Rico, as not part of the US, treating it differently than states for purposes of import duties. Um, but Gorsuch has a very lengthy uh, uh, reprimand and diatribe against the insular cases in this decision, which I recommend you all to read if you have not yet read. He notes, among other things, that the, uh, the view animating the insular cases and the incorporation theory they represent was, was based entirely on the presumption of white superiority. Next slide, please. Why should we care about the insular cases? They were decided the first one well over 100 years ago, over 120 years ago. Well, because they, they continue to plague the lower courts uh, and they justified continued maintenance of US colonies. Uh, as to the courts, they are notoriously difficult to apply. How can courts decide whether the Constitution applies or not in the territories? Well, they struggle. Uh, a few years ago, ago, a court in Puerto Rico ruled that the right to same-sex marriage did not apply in Puerto Rico, uh, despite what the Supreme Court had ruled. Uh, another court has found that people arriving into the U.S. Virgin Islands from the states not protected from warrantless searches and seizures, despite the Fourth Amendment's safeguard. Other courts have relied on the insular cases to withhold citizenship from uh, people in the territories. Justice Harlan points the way, as noted in the second uh, bullet here, uh, just as he did in Plessy v. Ferguson, he was a frequent dissenter in the insular cases. Asked why he dissented in those cases year after year, he replied that no question could be settled until settled right. We should settle this question right. The time is now for the court to overrule the insular cases. With that, I'll pass it to the next presenter, who I believe is Laura. It is me. Thank you so much, Alejandro. Uh, next slide, please. So the campaign against the insular cases is not just about the insular cases per se, but it is a fight against the impact that a century of adherence to these remnants of racist imperialistic thought and attitudes towards islands whose inhabitants were rarely consulted about or, ac or acqui asked to acquiesce to their relationship with the United States. Uh, the impact, uh, uh, you know, the impacts range from, you know, the inability to vote to, as, as Leah mentioned, the highest poverty rate of anywhere in the country. There is, it is not a coincidence that the federal programs that go to individuals in, to, in an attempt to alleviate poverty, 
to provide support, to provide what we call a safety net to the most vulnerable US citizens is not available to people in Puerto Rico, whether that's food stamps, uh, Medicaid, health benefits, Medicare, um, as well as SSI support for the blind, disabled, um, and elderly. The relationship between that and the high poverty rate is undeniable. So the campaign, as I said, is not just about the insular cases, but a fight against the impact. And there are various avenues for addressing those impacts, um, legislative, political, and legal. So on the legislative front, um, because the court has affirmed once again that it's in Congress's hands to make these decisions, just as it has always been in Congress's hands to make these decisions, we need to um, to push, to demand uh, the legislative legislature of Congress to include, to finally include Puerto Rico and other territories that don't have access to some of these programs um, in bills, in legislation. So uh, SSI for Puerto Rico was included in the reconciliation bill, Build Back Better, that was passed by the House last year. However, that bill died in the Senate. So we need Congress to, uh, to pass that to um, include Puerto Rico in the SSI program. Closing the meal gap is a legislative fix that would treat people in Puerto Rico who do not have adequate nutrition, uh, the same as other people in the rest of the country by providing the same amount of food stamps for those people who qualify who, who qualify for food stamps in Puerto Rico, but get a fraction of the amount uh, to feed their families that people who live in the states and some of the other territory, territories receive. And then there's the Territorial Equity Act, which is um, a, a, a broad bill that at really addresses almost all of the um, legislative inequities in Puerto Rico, um, you know, ranging, it includes food stamps, it includes Medicaid, it's a very broad bill. Um, and while something that sweeping may not have a, um, a chance of passing, what we can do and are doing is pulling out pieces of it to try to attach to other, other legislation, um, other vehicles that are moving. Um, political, there is a the political campaign. We have asked, uh, sent a letter to the Department of Justice asking them to publicly denounce the insular cases and state that they will no longer um, rely on them uh, to defend discrimination against, against US colonies. Um, it is really um, unfathomable fathomable to us that the, uh, the Biden administration, um, they have been asked to denounce these cases and yet they continue to show up in court and cite the insular cases as justification for Congress's ability to continue this discrimination. And the other avenue is legal. Um, there are um, efforts to find claimants, um, to find pla plaintiffs to challenge the insular cases uh, in court. Um, in federal court. There is a case uh, right now at the Supreme Court that is awaiting cert to be heard that should it be taken up would provide the court with an opportunity to once and for all overturn the insular cases. Um, this is not, uh, again, again, what was shocking in, in, about the unanimity in the recent uh, or near unanimity in the recent Valle Madero case is that over the years, there have been many Supreme Court justices who, who, who have not agreed, who have stated um, that uh, the insular cases are unconstitutional and um, should not be adhered to. As early as 1901, Justice Harlan, um, who was famously a dissenter in Plessy, he said in his dissent in one of the earliest insular cases that Congress, by action taken outside the Constitution, imposes upon our Republican institutions a colonial system such as exists under monarchy type governments. Surely such a result was never contemplated by the fathers of the Constitution. 
the idea that this country may acquire territories anywhere upon the earth by conquest or treaty and hold them as mere colonies or provinces, the people inhabiting them to enjoy only such rights as Congress chooses to accord them is wholly inconsistent with the spirit and genius as well as the words of the Constitution. Justice Brennan voiced a similar sentiment in 1974, and more recently, Justice Gorsuch did as well. To this day, and for the past 100 years, there has been no plausible rationale provided for this disparate treatment other than the original racism and xenophobia that spawned it. Uh, Next slide, please. Neil's going to uh, talk to talk us through one of the cases um, in, that are part of the legal efforts to overturn the Insular cases. Thank you, Laura. So um, the justices Gorsuch and Sotomayor in the Vio Madera decision um, both uh, made strong statements that they um, were looking to uh, overrule the Insular cases in an appropriate case and. Less than a week after they made that statement, um, we actually filed a petition to the Supreme Court in a case called Fittisimanu versus United States, calling on them to do just that. Um, the case uh, we represent John Fittisimanu, who was born in American Samoa, who under federal law is not recognized as a US citizen, despite being born on US soil, instead, labeled with a subordinate status of non-citizen national. You can see he, here in this picture, he has a US passport and inside in the fine print, it says the bearer of this is a US national, but not a citizen of the United States, uh, whatever that is supposed to mean. And you have the Biden Department of Justice uh, expressly relying on the insular cases uh, before the 10th circuit to argue against a right to sit, a constitutional right to citizenship in the territories because these so-called unincorporated territories are not, quote, in the United States. This, you know, almost 125 years after um, these areas first became part of the United States. Um, there's a growing coalition to call on the court uh, to take up the case and overrule the insular cases. Leading scholars, including many prominent Puerto Rican scholars, civil rights organizations, uh, former judges from each of the territories and others all coming together to call on the court to fix the problem that it itself created. Um, one wrinkle in the case, uh, American Samoans themselves are divided on this issue. Elected officials there um, have supported the federal government's position of deferring to Congress on the question of citizenship. Um, while others demand a recognition to their right. And, and what does this case mean for people in Puerto Rico and other territories? Um, if the lower court decision is upheld, it could put at risk the citizenship status of people born in Puerto Rico and other territories. That could mean that Congress could pass a law revoking um, the citizenship of people born in these areas moving forward, or perhaps even more troublingly, possibly even retroactively, which is why a number of elected current and former elected officials from the from other territories have spoken out so strongly against the federal government's position in these cases. So bottom line is there's an opportunity for the court to take up these issues and finally address them. Um, the Biden Department of Justice is going to have to clarify what its position is when it comes to citizenship in the territories, as well as the insular cases. And we shall see in the coming months um, how this all pans out. The Supreme Court's likely to decide whether to take up this case uh, this fall. And so stay tuned and appreciate everyone's support for this. Uh, next slide, I'll go ahead and hand it off. Thanks so much. Um, so there is real urgency for a legislative fix. Um, the court said that Congress may extend SSI benefits to Puerto Rico. Um, and indeed, the Solicitor General, when he was arguing um, against Mr. Valle Madero, informed the court that the president supports such legislation as a matter of policy. And um, we, we, we know that that is certainly what the president 
has stated, um, but this SCOTUS ruling as a result of both the Trump and Biden appeals overturned the favorable lower court decisions um, saying that Puerto Rico should have access to the program. So SSI for Puerto Rico and the other territories was legal while those lower rulings were in place. All that was missing was Congress approving the necessary money to fund what the court already said Puerto Rico and the other territories um, who currently do not have SSI should have. So with the lower court rulings in place, it was going to cost $400 million to get SSI to Puerto Rico and the other three territories that don't have it. Uh, Guam, US Virgin Islands and American Samoa. Northern Mariana has full access to SSI. So, um, you know, this isn't, this isn't even a case of consistency where uh, Congress has said that, um, that people in territories shouldn't have access to, access to SSI because they live in territories, because Northern Mariana, people who live in Northern Mariana, fortunately do have access to SSI. Now that with the Valle Madero uh, Supreme Court ruling, it's going to cost between 15 to 20 billion over a 10 year period to provide SSI to the territories that currently don't have it. That means it is going to be make this even more uh, of an uphill battle in Congress uh, where they are now um, arguing and negotiating over the size of current bills. Um, so as a result of the Valle Madero ruling, the, uh, the, the, um, the bill, um, the price tag for SSI has um, gone up exponentially. Um, SSI for the territories was included in Build Back Better, as I said, which did not pass last year, but there's still a chance that Congress is working on a pending reconciliation bill being discussed in Congress. And we need to continue pressing um, our champions uh, in Congress and in the White House to include SSI. But if Congress doesn't act this term, future progress is going to be difficult to impossible. It either happens now or it doesn't happen for the foreseeable future is what I believe. Congress will choose to maintain the status quo of suffering because the rational basis that the solicitor general who argued on behalf of the Biden administration said was in place was that it just cost too much money. That was their rational basis. And the court agreed that the uh, that Congress had the right to, um, uh, that that was a legitimate claim on behalf of Congress. It was too expensive. Um, next slide. We also need uh, administrative leadership and political leadership. President Biden has indeed accomplished so much in his first year in regards to Puerto Rico. Um, he has gone beyond um, merely uh, undoing uh, the damage that the previous administration did by withholding federal support, by withholding even more federal support from Puerto Rico. Um, President Biden has um, really uh, worked with Congress to make some important changes in some federal safety net uh, programs or tax programs like the child tax credit, which is now available to families in Puerto Rico with children, um, which uh, completely the same as it is in the States, which it was not before. Um, and so, you know, he, he really, we, it's night and day in Puerto Rico because of that. And we really commend him for that. Um, but that's also why it was such a disappointment that uh, his administration continued this appeal. Um, he has made campaign statements and um, he has also signaled uh, as president his support for uh, making the legislative changes to include these programs. So we need to continue uh, pressing on him uh, to provide that leadership to include these programs in the budgets that he sends to Congress and to uh, not take no for an answer from Congress um, and make it as much of a priority as he does for other issues such as climate change. We're talking about people's lives here. Um, as Justice Sotomayor said, it is not handing money to the Puerto Rican government. This is money by and large that goes directly to into the pockets of low-income people um, to help them achieve potentially life-saving 
access potentially life-saving care. Correcting disparities in SSI and food stamps, the NAP program alone, would put approximately $2.8 billion each year directly into the pockets of the most vulnerable citizens living in Puerto Rico. Talk about having an impact on poverty rates. Um, correcting Medicaid and Medicare would bring billions more to Puerto Rico, where federal health care expenditures per capita are about one third of what is spent in the 50 states. Um, and it would also allow the Puerto Rican government to redirect the limited resources, its limited resources to pay for essential services, cut back under the austerity measures imposed by the, uh, uh, by the FOMB. So, um, you know, next slide, please. We want to also, you know, make the point that at this, while people who live in Puerto Rico may be politically disenfranchised, more Puerto Ricans live in the US than live on the island. A uh, little over about 3.2 million people live on the island of Puerto Rico, over 5 million Puerto Ricans live in the States. And this is just a sample of the Puerto Rican population in some very important states um, that have a huge impact on the outcomes of federal, um, uh, of federal elections. Um, and what we, um, what Puerto Ricans that live in the US um, can and do vote. Uh, we saw in the last election, just taking Florida as an example, that when candidates engage directly with Puerto Rican voters on issues that matter to them, they will turn out to vote for that candidate. So, um, you know, elections, people who are, are up for re-election um, should think about um, how, what Puerto Rican voters want and need and what they care about and um, make those a reality when they are elected to political office. Uh, next slide. So what can you do, um, you know, include the federal, include the territories and federal advocacy. We have seen a, a massive shift in advocacy by federal um, uh, federal groups that care about things like poverty, um, nutrition and children, um, access to health care. And those groups are now in including the territories in their advocacy. If they're fighting for the child tax credit, they're also fighting for the child tax credit in Puerto Rico, access to the child tax credit in Puerto Rico. And this has been a, a this has been a sea change um, in having other groups whose mission, you know, it, it should include Puerto Rico. Um, it should, you know, for those groups, just like we're telling the federal government, it shouldn't matter where you live. If you care about children not going to bed hungry at night, you should care about the children in Puerto Rico. And so that has been, um, that has been a, a, a sea change, as I said, and I think has made a difference. Um, Hispanic Federation will be uh, circulating a coalition letter um, calling on Congress to expand SSI, Medicaid, SNAP, et cetera. Um, and we would encourage you when you, it comes across your inbox for your organizations to sign it. And then the other thing is um, continuing to put pressure on the Biden administration. Um, you can support our efforts to press the Biden administration to say publicly that they will no longer rely on this racist doctrine um, to justify discrimination against people in Puerto Rico. Uh, next slide. Uh, all of our organizations have, um, uh, have websites, have material, have resources, um, have filed briefs in Bio Madero um, that you can look up and find easily. Um, but we encourage you to join us. I am so uh, excited by all the people in the chat who have said that they want to uh, use this material and begin educating or do more education in classrooms and with others about these issues. Um, we have found that um, you know, when people find out about, about this, that they um, become just as outraged. This is not just an issue for Puerto Ricans. This is an issue for anybody who cares about fairness and equality and um, the, uh, the human rights of people who live in this country. So I think we, uh, we have a couple minutes left. Um, I don't know if we have any questions that we want to take. Um, yes. 
Thank you. Thank you very much to all the presenters for this great discussion on this issue. Um, we want, I want to quickly at least address two questions from the chart. From the chat. Uh, one of them is uh, from Richard Figueroa, uh, which is related to other people's uh, same questions. During oral argument, Justice Gorsuch invited counsel for Vallejo Madero to address the insular cases. If counsel had accepted to pursue that approach, would it have made a difference? Ooh. Maybe Alejandro, I don't. Sure, I'll jump in. I'll, I don't think so, uh, because uh, Justice Gorsuch got into it with the uh, attorney representing the Department of Justice quite a bit as well. Uh, and you know, the court, you know, and he made clear, um, Gorsuch did his, his views on the insular cases. Uh, so I don't think it would have made a difference because he engaged with you know, one of the parties on it. They can write whatever they want. I think Gorsuch really just wanted to vent in this concurrence, and he's, you know, as Neil Weir indicated, he invited uh, a more appropriate vehicle, and that is possibly the Fittesimanu case that Neil uh, filed recently for a petition. Um, before going to the last questions to address, um, I want to mention that the presentation has been recorded and is going to be posted in the Hispanic Federation Facebook page and YouTube channel. And if the presenters want to share their contacts uh, through the chat, you, you are more than welcome. Uh, a few person has been asking for your contacts. Um, then um, for the second question, uh, a few people have talked about um, a, if the doctrine of the insular cases, I'm going to, to you know, try to, to summarize the question. The doctrine of the insular cases means that the citizenship uh, of Puerto Rico given uh, in 1917 is not permanent. I think maybe Neil. Could. Yeah, I, I could take that. Yeah, so it's uh, it is disturbing, but the federal government's position is that uh, citizenship for people born in Puerto Rico and other territories is not the same as citizenship for people born elsewhere on U.S. soil. And what that means as a practical matter is what Congress giveth, Congress can taketh away. That their view is that Congress can essentially turn the citizenship clause and the guarantee of birthright citizenship on and off. Um, and that's what a number of uh, groups and, and leaders from each of the territories uh, will be presenting to the court as one of the, the problems of the federal government's position. What this means in terms of status and other issues uh, is uh, it doesn't, doesn't really address some of the broader status issues that are brought up in, in the new status bill. Um, but these are this case and these broader issues are important to keep an eye on over the coming months as the Supreme Court and other branches of the federal government continue to either take action or continue to have inaction on these issues. Thank you, Neil. Um, Laura. Just, yeah, if I could just say one thing, I see uh, uh, there are a couple of questions that touch on the status bill wending its way through Congress. Of course, it's not wending its way because it hasn't been introduced yet. Um, but I would say that, you know, our position at Hispanic Federation is that the status of the territory itself should have no bearing on how people, individuals are treated on the island. They're American citizens. These are the people in the other territories who are denied citizenship are still under the flag of the US and they should be treated the same as everybody else, uh, regardless of the legal status of the place where they happen to reside. Thank you, Laura. Um, so we are, it's already time on, uh, we thank everybody for joining. We hope you join our campaign. And this is just one, uh, you know, one event and we will keep fighting for uh, the insular cases to get overruled. Thank you everybody. everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, really appreciate it. Thank you everyone.